Now, for four years, over 300 testimonies, a billion rand spent, the state capture report was finally handed over to President Cyril Ramaphosa at the Union Buildings last night. The two-part report, made up of volumes five and six, is the culmination of the work of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture that was chaired by Chief Justice Raymond Sondo. The SABC, the Bartokloff Landing, Parliament's oversight role, the role of the ANC are just some of the new additions in the final volume. The Commission was tasked to investigate allegations of corruption and fraud in state organs. Lawyer advocate Tembeka Nukaitobi joins us virtually to give us a bit of analysis. Great to have you, advocate. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. So, I mean, this all started back in 2016 when the uh, former public protector, Tuli Madonsela, in her remedial action, recommended that a commission be established following allegations of state capture. Um, uh, Zondo said that they couldn't investigate everything. That was in terms of the reference. Otherwise, it would have likely taken 10 years. We already saw it taking a lot longer than the initial, what was it, about 180 days or something that the public protector recommended. W what was the commission asked to investigate and what were the parameters of the terms of reference? So the terms of reference that were established by uh, Advocate Madonsela were much more narrow. Uh, the bulk of her report focused mainly on, I would say, ESCOM capture. And that was the primary um, concern that she had. Um, what then happened was that the President Zuma uh, did that and basically refused to appoint the Commission of Inquiry. The matter was settled in the uh, North Gauteng High Court when the judges decided that he had an obligation to comply with the remedial action of the public protector. What he then did was to expand quite substantially the terms of reference when he finally appointed the Commission of Inquiry to consider virtually each and every act of malfeasance and corruption uh, for an indeterminate period among all three levels of government, national, provincial, local, and across the entire parastatal sector. So from the onset, unless the commission itself attempted to narrow down the scope in time and in subject of what it had to do, it would have been a failure. So the commission itself has accepted that there are certain aspects of its mandate that it couldn't investigate. I mean, if you think about it, if they could investigate each and every province, the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, Gauteng, they would never finish their work. Yeah. If they investigated each and every municipality, they would never finish their work. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they adopted a thematic approach, focusing on a parastatal by parastatal, depending on those parastatals that were sort of high up in the state capture list, and also focused on certain chosen uh, provinces, Fred Adair coming from the Free State, and also chosen certain national ministries. In the last report, the SAPS is mentioned, as well as the National Intelligence Agency is mentioned. And that was the only realistic way in which they could actually execute on their mandate. So, I mean, Parliament, the reality is, is, is meant to lead the implementation of the plan. But MPs knew and when were informed about the happenings when these things were going on. I mean, we know this. So do you expect the institution to do differently and driving the process with integrity? I mean, we were told last night by the president that um, with, within four months, he will present to parliament an implement, implementation plan. But of course, questions arise on why will it take another four months and when will recommendations be implemented if that's the case? Yes, I mean, I think that raises a deeper question, Leanne, which is what is the role of commissions of inquiry in a country like South Africa? So we usually appoint commissions of inquiry in moments of national crisis, when there is deep pain and when there is, I would say, a complex problem to be resolved. And also sometimes when we are trying to grapple with a moment uh, that has caused consternation in the nation. So often commissions of inquiry are national responses to a national calamity. And what we try to do with commissions of inquiry is to understand the scope of the problem. So commissions of inquiry do not in themselves produce a solution. What they do, they enable us to understand the depth of the problem. So they are instruments to shine a spotlight 
to a particular uh, traumatic event usually. So in this particular commission of inquiry, what we have at least um, uh, become uh, familiar with, most of these facts we were already aware of, but what we didn't know was the scale of the problem. I mean, we knew for many, many years about the problems relating to Ganda, the problems relating to the role of President Zuma, the problems relating to capture of uh, SARS, um, capture of ESCOM, capture of Transnet. Those were all reported in the newspapers. What we didn't know is what was happening in the back room, what was happening at the board meeting when all of these events uh, uh, were unfolded. And in relation to the last report, what we didn't know is what was happening at Lutuli House, what was happening in the top six, what was happening in the NEC. Why did the ANC, a party that came into office with the explicit mandate to root out the corruption of apartheid, why did it become complicit to apartheid, I mean, to corruption? So that is what we didn't know. We now know, because it's been laid bare, that senior members of the ANC either themselves participated actively in acts of corruption, or if they didn't participate actively, they turned a blind eye. Mm. Mm. I didn't read the full report. There are many pages to it. Yeah. What did strike me was the report relating to the role of President Ramaphosa himself. Yes. President yes. Judge Zondo basically paints him as someone who did that, someone who was calculating someone who tried to put the party above everything, someone who tried to examine the balance of forces in the party before he could take action. That's a very important insight into how capture actually is enabled and therefore how the country collectively in the future can try and address it. Now, as far as parliament is concerned, parliament itself is unable to resolve capture. What it is able to do is to hold certain people accountable. The problem of capture is a national problem. It can only be resolved if the entire nation responds to it, not in a selective way, but in a collective way. So, for instance, we know the facts. But again, people are mischievous when they say, well, why is the NPA not prosecuted? These are not cases that are prosecution ready. These are cases that are at the beginning of a prosecutorial process, whereby the NPA still needs to verify whether or not any of these cases are prosecutable from a criminal standard point of view. Yeah. So the best we can expect from a commission of inquiry is more information and more insight and perhaps a better understanding of who we are. That is what a commission does. It is a mirror. It has told us precisely who we are. And perhaps from that point of view, we can rebuild, we can actually take a realistic view that the idea that we are an exceptional nation has probably been uh, put to some doubt. Mm. I, I mean, the, the, yeah, you really did hit the nail on the head there because I, I don't know where we go from here. And obviously we want repercussions, but the findings are so negative towards the ruling party, the ANC, that they were complicit to state capture, that in fact they encouraged state capture. That is one of the, the major findings that came through this. You mentioned it yourself. The president, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, the, the, in this coming out here, basically, um, it, it, the, Justice Zondo saying that there's, it's very hard to believe that the, the deputy president of the time was completely unaware of this. And the fact that um, he was saying he would do more being inside the party than outside the party, but acknowledges in the report that Ramaphosa did very little within the party to try and stop this. So, you know, that again throws a massive question mark and also a question mark over the future of the president continuing to be the president of the ANC and the party. And we need to talk about that. And of course, uh, uh, President Jacob Zuma and former President Jacob Zuma, of course, being um, fingered very badly within, within this, that state capture existed. Whose fault was it, though? That was one of the questions that the journalists did ask. Was it the Guptas that captured the president or the president captured by the Guptas? What was it? Well, I mean, I think that binary has itself been proven to be sort of a false way of asking the question. I think what is the right question, and I think that's, what the, that's why this was an important commission, but is the right question is what were the circumstances that enabled to capture why did constitutional institutions fail? 
because you have to accept in any constitutional democracy that there are people that will try and drive ulterior agendas. Why are institutions not robust enough to withstand those ulterior agendas? That to me is a broader and perhaps more relevant question than asking the binary whether it was Mr. Zuma who captured the Guptas or the Guptas captured Mr. Zuma. The question is asking why are private interests able to triumph over the public good? That's the re real question. Mm -hmm. And to that question, the answer is, of course, as always, complex. One of the reasons why private interests are able to triumph over the public good is when individuals, people that are put in institutions in order to protect the public interest, connive with the private interests, is when they refuse to accept their mandate under the constitution to look after the welfare of the nation. And this has been an important revelation. And it is when the good people in public institutions do nothing, turn a blind eye, protect themselves, protect their jobs. That is what enables a moment of capture. And if we don't learn that lesson, if we try to individualize this and say, well, it was Mr. Zuma, and say, well, it was, uh, it was the Guptas, it was perhaps Mr. Zuma's son. If we don't learn the broader lesson that capture is enabled when those people that are in power connive to protect private interests and to protect their personal interests. Capture is also enabled when good people do nothing. And those are the two greatest lessons we should take from this report, rather than trying to ask, you know, if we didn't have a president like Mr. Zuma, could we have state capture? So for the future, what Judge Zondo has been able to do is to put a mirror and to tell us to look at the mirror. And if we don't like what we see, we are seeing ourselves. And that is a big lesson for the future. This is a collective responsibility. This is not a game between Zuma and Ramaphosa. This is not a contest between the Guptas and uh, other business interests. This is a national calamity. And it is urgent that actually it, is, it receives a national response. Indeed it does. I, I, yeah, I mean, let, let's, let's look at this national response because we look at the National Prosecuting Authority now. They're saying that, the, that, that we'll see prosecutions between three and six months' time. I'm not convinced. I don't know if you're convinced. Do you, do you think this is going to happen? Yes. There are prosecutions that are already uh, underway. They are not a direct result of the State Capture Commission but they are parallel to it. And some of the evidence collected during the State Capture Commission could provide a basis, not conclusive evidence, because these two are separate processes, could provide a basis. The transnet um, prosecutions uh, will commence soon because the arrests have been effected. The Bosasa prosecutions have already commenced. Uh, arrests were effected during the course of last year. And there should be prosecutions quite soon in relation to clear-cut cases like the massive theft of money from the intelligence agencies. So there are those, I would say, uh, I don't like the term, but low hanging fruits. And they may not be the direct outcome of the report, but what they will do is they will reinforce some of these recommendations that have been made. So those prosecutions are already ongoing anyway. The only question is whether or not the information we now know from the State Capture Commission will either expedite those, those prosecutions or add additional information to those prosecutions, or whether it will create, I would say, a new platform for new prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Now, in so far as the second question is concerned, which is creating new avenues for new prosecutions, I would say that it's still too early. The expectations should be a little bit measured. It's not a simple question of saying, Judge Zondo, has made a certain prima facie finding, and therefore, Advocate Batoi must prosecute. Building a prosecution case and a prosecutable case is a hard job. You don't simply take a piece of paper from a commission of inquiry and say, here is a crime. What you do, you build on a docket, you collect witness statements that are admissible in court. The mere fact that they were admissible at the Commission of Inquiry does not automatically and without more make them admissible in a criminal court. And thereafter, you make an assessment or a judgment 
as to whether or not you can sustain a prosecutable case on a prima facie basis in a court of law. Only at that stage does a prosecutor actually draw up an indictment and sign it off for presentation to a possible accused. Yeah. So I would simply caution against the sort of pressure that, uh, well, the NPA must now prosecute. There is still a long road between the report and prosecution. Yes. I mean, that's what people have been saying. This could take years. Indeed. And one of the factors that will contribute to that delay is that there are inevitable applications for judicial review. Some of the complaints are people were not given a hearing. Some of the complaints is that the evidence wasn't properly weighed. Some of the complaints is that inadmissible evidence was taken into account. But let me make one point about this, these complaints. If you look at the scale of the undertaking, it was a large undertaking. There are no perfect commissions of inquiry. It is inevitable that there will be an error or two. But you don't judge the failure or success of a commission of inquiry as large as this by one or two mistakes. You, you judge it by its substantive input to the life or the rehabilitation of the nation. We must remember, this country was built on the back of a commission of inquiry. It was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that told us what apartheid was like. And it was on the back of that commission that we had to work out from the ruins of the apartheid state what to make of the new South Africa. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this is another moment in which we are given, in a sense, a second lease of life to say, here is a commission. It's told you what your country is like. Now build it again. I want to ask you um, a little bit about, you know, the, the, the before wranglings and what was going on with the, re the release of this report. Um, Ramaphosa it was asked by journalists the, uh, with regard to the phone calls between himself and Zondo, bringing up that the report might deal with Ramaphosa's dealings with, at the commission. Um, also, the timing of these reports coinciding with a criminal case that uh, has been laid, of course, against the president on the Palapala issue, um, which has caused the divided views on whether President Ramaphosa is in the right standing to receive it. I want to ask your view and the implications of this. And we also have seen, obviously, uh, what was said about the state security agencies. You mentioned it yourself and, of course, with Arthur Fraser's involvement as well, who laid those criminal charges. But what is this doing to the report now? Now, it's the complaint that President Ramaphosa is not in a position to receive the report because of the recent criminal charges against him is mischief. He is the president of the country. He is entitled by law to receive the report. There is no other person who can receive the report. Secondly, the complaint by Mr. Arthur Fraser is irrelevant to the issues that were being debated before the Judge Zondo uh, Commission of Inquiry. So there is just no relationship between the two. And so far as the Arthur Fraser complaint is concerned, my understanding on publicly available information is that the matter is now before the hawks because a complaint has been laid before the hawks. So the hawks must make up their judgment as to whether or not the information that they have in their possession shows a prima facie a criminal case that is prosecutable and possibly winnable in a court of law. And what we do as the nation, we hope that when they exercise that judgment, they do so without fear, without favor, without prejudice. They don't take into account the status of President Ramaphosa in deciding whether he should or should not be prosecuted. This is precisely what the State Capture Project was about. It was about ensuring that there are no untouchables in our republic. And, and indeed, the president himself, as you're saying, I mean, this is, this is certainly something that needs to be respected through a court of law, and we need to find out what the answers are, but we need to find out what the answers are. I want to ask you, I'm going to continue the interview. I hope you don't mind, Advocate. We're into our news time, but if we can just steal about five minutes, this is our top story, and I think people are, are really enjoying your analysis of all of this. I, I want to talk still a little bit about this, ex this extension that we saw. Um, the commission applying for extensions to the court because they couldn't meet the initial deadlines. And we do know this was, it, it, it's a lot of work that's gone into it. And we are re realizing it as we read it. But there's still a lot of skepticism um, um, on the release of the, the, the fifth and sixth part because the report was set to be released on the 15th of June. That was Sunday. The date was then postponed to the Monday, then again to the Wednesday, and then again a bit later 
uh, in the evening. Um, and, and we know the president is quite a stickler for timing. I is there anything we can read into this? And also phone calls that were taking place between uh, the president and Judge Zondo. You know the law. You know what goes on behind the scenes. Is this a normal procedure? We were told to please trust them. Nothing untoward happened. Is that good enough? Will that put fears aside for South Africans or not? Yes, I mean, firstly, if we look at the sort of history of this entire commission, it has applied for many extensions. Remember that this was meant to be a six month undertaking, but a six month undertaking was unrealistic from the get go. So it was almost inevitable that it would be extended. Now, the problem was that that original six months was also imposed by a judge. It was part and parcel of a court order. I think Judge Mlambo presided over that uh, judgment. Every time that six months elapsed, Judge Zondo has applied for extensions. What happened here is that the last extension was about to lapse, but the report was unavailable and there was no application for the extension. But that is not a legal crisis because a judge can extend the lifespan of the commission and amend the previous court order. So as a matter of law, nothing invalidates the report simply on account of the fact that it was not delivered timelessly, especially because Judge Zonda himself has acknowledged that he intends asking for the extension of time. That's the one issue around timing. It's all within the purview of the judges to grant an extension. And previously, I, I can't, I've lost count, I think there have been six or seven previous extensions, and none of those have resulted in any legal problem. There is a second issue, which is what to make of the conversations between Judge Zondo and the president. From what is available publicly, Judge Zondo says that he did not discuss the substance of the report with the president. We couldn't expect him to do that. He is the chief justice. The president will probably only know about the contents of the report when he opens and reads it, because it was all under lock, uh, 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 lock and key until last night. His explanation is that the conversation was about the timing. Of course, it has to be about the timing, because he needs to ensure that when he is ready and when the president is ready, he will be available at the president's house at half past six when he gives him the report. So there's nothing untoward about those conversations. So nothing of the two concerns that have been raised actually raises a legal problem. And there's a last issue about this uh, timing. And this is this, how long does it take to actually investigate the life of a nation? How long does it? If you actually look at how long have other commissions actually taken, the Marikana Commission was also expected to last no long, uh, 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 a short period of time. How long did it take? It ultimately took three years. And it was investigating an event that took place in one day. One day. And it took over three years. Now, you are dealing with a commission that is investigating events that took place probably over nine years, probably even longer. How long should that take? So I would say if you actually put it in perspective, the commission has actually done its work fairly expeditiously and fairly quickly. If you look at the depth of what they have done, the length of the reports, and quite the scale of the work that they had to do. So when you actually look at this objectively from a uh, a, a broader perspective, what you, the conclusion you can only reach is that given the size of the work that they have to do, given the limited resources that they were working under, they actually did a pretty good job in finishing this report timelessly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's so good getting an explanation from you because South Africans are angry, and rightly so. I mean, advocate, you can, you can understand the anger. I mean, we are talking... I still don't know what the final amount is. I mean, there's, there's amounts of between 500 million 
um, rand that may have got, uh, uh, sorry, 500 billion rand. I don't even know how many zeros we're talking about to a trillion rand. You have a Gupta family that may have benefited up to uh, 57 billion rand, 60 billion rand from state capture that we're looking at the lives that South Africans are leading. We're looking at state-owned enterprises that have fallen apart due to this. And people yes. want to see results and very quickly. But I think you've, you've sobered our minds in terms of expectations and we, we need to understand the complexity of this, which we do. But can we turn our attention to the Guptas, please, for a moment? Because at the end of the day, this was where it all came from. It, it, it started there and it got much bigger. I, I don't even know. Are they still in a jail in Dubai? Do we know this? Um, what happens to them? Are we ever going to see them? Are they ever going to pay money back? Are we ever going to see the justice handed to them that they rightly deserve from everything we've been reading in these reports? Yes, hopefully. They are, this is the promising part of this. And maybe it is related, even tangentially, to the Commission of Inquiry. The promising part is that the people that were at the heart of the state capture project, the Gupta family, have finally been uh, charged, or at least there is an indictment to charge them. So what that means is that there is a criminal case that is prosecutable, that the prosecuting authority have decided on. Whether good or bad, but at the very least, a charge sheet has been drawn up by the prosecutors. That is a major step forward. Because you must remember, in white collar crimes, it takes years to draw up indictments because you have to put pieces, many pieces of the puzzle together. And often white collar criminals hide their tracks. They don't steal money like robbing a bank with a, a machine gun. What they do is they have many intermediaries so that it becomes impossible to trace the money from the source to the white collar criminal. So the fact that within such a short space of time, because you remember the Guptas themselves fled this country no longer than four years ago. The fact that within such a short space of time, an indictment has been drawn is a positive step forward. Mm -hmm. The second major development in this is that the Guptas have been arrested, according to what we know publicly. They've been arrested in Dubai. And the third major development is that the proceedings for their extradition have begun. Now, these are very big developments because it is not easy to chase after sophisticated white collar criminals in general. Whether the Guptas themselves are criminals is something that a judge in this country will establish. But the NPA and the Department of Justice should now be working on a project to return the Guptas to face their comeuppance. They do have an extradition agreement with the United Arab Emirates. They should be enforcing that extradition agreement. That too will take time, but they need to start acting. Personally, I am confident that at a certain point in time, the group of people that were at the heart of the state capture project, according to the Zondo Commission report, they will come to South Africa and they will face the music. Now, that is what we should be putting our energies behind, is encouraging, cajoling, putting pressure on Advocate Shamila Batohi, putting pressure on Minister Ronald Lamula to ensure that that family is seen on the television screens of South Africa in a South African court and explaining themselves. So, so that, the, that we have made so much progress on setting the wheels of justice in motion around the Gupta family is very big news. Advocate, um, is it normal that I don't want to let you go? I need to let you go, and I know that. I have to let you go. But there's last question, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be a long one, but it's very different to state capture, or is it? Um, the view, I need your view on the DA leader, John Steenhuisen, writing to the FBI to investigate President Ramaphosa. W what, what are the, is this possible? I mean, when we look at something like this from the legal perspective, um, them doing that, ca can it actually happen? Yes, I mean, obviously the DA can write to the FBI if they want, but I'm personally very skeptical 
that if you want to investigate a president of South Africa, you will go to an American law enforcement agency. I think we have to question the wisdom of Mr. John Steinhazen in that regard. We have an independent hawks in this country. We have an independent NPA. We have an independent judiciary. We have to trust them to do their work. It doesn't matter that the president is an implicated party. This work should be done by our own independent institutions. It should not be done by an external force in the form of the FBI. So I question the wisdom of Mr. Steinhausen writing to an institution outside of South Africa, effectively inviting them to interfere in an investigation that our own independent hawks have commenced. Unless we have enough evidence that the hawks will not treat the matter seriously, mm. my own judgment is that it's ill-advised for Mr. Steinhausen to draw in the FBI to this issue. This is an issue that our hawks must investigate with no fear, with no favor, and uh, with no prejudice. And there we leave it. Thank you. Advocate, such sobering analysis, and we thank you very, very much for your wisdom on this. Advocate Tembeka and Mukai Tobi discussing the release of the final state capture report following the release of the complete volume yesterday. That is the big story of the day. In fact, that is the story, and uh, that is what's uh, topping all of our news bulletins. But the other story, I think, that... Uh,